Well, hey church, welcome back to the Midweek Devotional. I'm excited today to be jumping into Acts chapter 10, and we're going to be talking about Peter's vision today. And more specifically, how do we know that a vision comes from God? So Acts chapter 10, if you look at the very beginning of the chapter, there's this, this man named Cornelius who has a vision, and uh, in this vision it says, the Bible says, uh, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Send men to Joppa, bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel had spoke to him, had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from those who had attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So here we have in the very beginning of this chapter, we have this man who is a devout man. He is a Gentile man, but he is very devout. The Bible says he fears God and everyone around him respects him. And he hears that, that there's a man named Simon, Peter, who God is going to relay a message to him from. Then in verse 9, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. He became hungry, wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance, or you could say he, he's uh, kind of daydreaming or sleeping, um, either way. And he became... Um, in it, there were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. This is very important because Peter answers and says, By no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. This is a very important thing. God is telling Peter, Hey, these animals are unlawful for you to eat, but I want you to eat them. And... Peter says at first, hey, listen, I do not think that I should do this. Um, this happens in verse 16. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up to heaven. Now, this is a very important time. Three is always a number of completion. It's always a number of perfection. It's the number of the Trinity. And um, so the fact that it happens three times is a really good indicator, but I, I'm not someone who gets so wrapped up into numbers that, that I'm someone who says, you know, oh, someone said the word Canada to me three times, so that means I need to move to Canada. That, that, I don't want to get that wrapped into it. It is important, but I think there's some other indicators in this passage that will show us, hey, here's how you know. Here's how God verifies his word. And the first one is, is going to seem counterintuitive because typically what we as Christians say is, well, God will never give you a vision. He'll never give you a dream. He'll never send you on a mission that doesn't line up with his word. But in the Old Testament, Peter is not allowed biblically to eat any of the things that the Bible is saying. And so uh, is there a contradiction in the Bible here? No. The answer is actually that Jesus had said to Peter uh, and to the disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. So while Peter may not have had that written down, it is a part of the Bible. So it does match up with the Bible. And every now and then I'll hear people say, well, this is an inconsistency and they'll attack the Bible. It's not really an inconsistency. It may not have been in Peter's written word. We don't know. Uh, perhaps they had already at this time some of, the, some of the things that Jesus said written down. We don't really know. But it does line up with the rest of the Bible. So the Bible says that Peter was pondering the vision, and the Spirit said to him, this is verse 19, Behold, three men are looking for you. So again, there's this number three. Again, it's an important number. Rise, go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said, I am the one you were looking for. What is the reason for your coming? Then Peter then begins to, uh, he goes with the men. He reaches this man named Cornelius. He preaches to this man named Cornelius. Cornelius actually bows down to him and worships him. And he says, no, 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 no. I'm just someone like you. And uh, Cornelius explains, hey, I had a vision also. And this, I think, is one of the important indicators. Uh, an important indicator is there is there another person um, who is agreeing with you on what God is saying. Now, we'll see this in further detail in a moment. But um, so 
Verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable for him. And he then begins to preach to the Gentiles. The Gentiles then are saved, and then the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, falls upon the Gentiles. So two good indicators that God is, um, is drawing you or giving you this vision or this calling or God is, God is telling you, hey, I want you to do something is, are people getting saved because of it? So an obvious one here, I think, is, um, hey, God told me I don't need to go to church. At, well, are you a part of giving the gospel? It's really hard to do that if you're sitting on your couch watching on TV. Not that we think that's wrong. We have this for this reason. But I don't think that God is calling us not to be a part of the local church. And so often we'll hear people say, well, we are the church. It's not a building. And yes, that, that technically is true. But that's not how that was intended to sound. The idea of it is that the church must go into the world and preach the gospel and gather together in a building. The idea is being taken out of context right now. And so is God really telling you to never witness to anyone else again? Probably not. Is God really telling you that you have, need to never be around other believers again? Probably not. I know someone uh, close firsthand, they said there were some hypocrites at their church, and they said, well, because there's hypocrites, God's telling me I don't need to go to this church anymore. They never went to another church. They fell out of church. Their life began to be in shambles, and, and it ended very bitterly, very sadly, with their family all pulled apart. And that doesn't happen to everyone but I often wondered if they had someone who would have been there to say, hey, listen, leaving church is not God telling, God's not telling you to leave the body of Christ. Maybe perhaps he's telling you to find another one, perhaps. But he's not telling you to leave the body of Christ, sit on the couch and watch preachers on TV who don't know your name and know nothing about you. Then the Bible says that the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. So again, another really good indicator is the Holy Spirit falling on people around you. Is what you're doing, is it, is it being inspired and led by the Holy Spirit? Not your spirit, the Holy Spirit. Then if you look at verse chapter 11, Peter then reports to the church. Obviously, the church is a little bit upset about this. They're like, we don't understand why you're witnessing to Gentiles. Peter then goes into this full account. He gives the entire uh, story to the elders of this church. When it says um, all the way down in verse 18, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Here's, I, I think, a really good indicator of, is God really telling you to do something? Are you willing to share it with the elders, the leaders of your church, the leaders of your group, your pastors? And do they agree with you? I'm not saying you have to get their permission, but it's, it's respectful at least to say to your group leader, hey, God's telling me this, God's calling me to this. I think it's a really good idea. If you're confident in what God is telling you, God is telling me to marry her. I think it's a really good idea to sit down with the elders of your church and say, I believe this. Can you, can you talk with me about it? Now, that's not saying you have to go to them for permission, but it's a good idea to go to people and say, hey, can you, can you help walk me through this? It's a good idea to go to the leaders of the church. It's a good idea to go to the pastors of the church, the elders of the church, your small group leader. It's a good idea to say, hey, God is telling me that this needs to happen. Well, they might disagree with me, so instead I'll just find some preacher on YouTube who agrees with me. I don't think that's the answer. We don't find Peter having this vision preaching to these men and then getting on YouTube and clicking, is it okay to do this until he finds a preacher who agrees with him? We don't, we don't find Peter doing that. I think it's a really solid, good way of knowing, hey, is God really telling me to do this? By saying to someone you love, someone you trust, maybe gathering 
um, your team leader if you're a part of our church, your group leader if you're a part of our church, maybe asking them, hey, can, can I sit down with one of the elders if you, if you know them or one of the pastors and saying, hey, God's telling me to marry this, this person. What do you think? God's telling me to divorce this person. What do you think? God's telling me to move here. What do you think? God's telling me to do this. What do you think? And just getting a good sounding board for it. Because the Bible says that, that Satan himself is disguised often as an angel of light. And so it's really easy to fall victim to like, oh, this is, God is telling me this and so I'm doing it. Only to realize later, you know what? I don't think that was a good idea. Another reason I think it's so important to do this is later on in the book of Acts, it becomes really difficult for these people to give the, Bible, to give the gospel to the Gentiles. And when you have people behind you and beside you cheering you on in the hard times, and, and you have that moment of reminding yourself, oh yeah, I remember, I asked, God, I asked this person, hey, is God really calling me into a relationship with this person? And, and we prayed about it, and they said yes, and they explained why. And, and you know what? Yeah, I think that, you know what? We can get through this. I think that's really an important thing. So Peter um, has a couple of really good indicators. Number one, um, people are saved. Is it drawing you closer to God, and are, is it helping you draw more people along with you? I think that's a question that we all should ask every time we're going to ask, hey, is this God's will? Another one is thing, simply this. Is there someone in your church, local church family who you trust, who you are being authentic with, and who you're willing to say to them, hey, walk with me through this? I'm not telling you you have to get permission just saying, get someone to walk through it with you. What does it look like? If you're, if you're thinking, hey, God's calling me into marriage, it's wise to ask a married person, not another single person, what does marriage look like? So that you have a good answer of what God is calling you actually into. I think that it's always good to have a little uh, advice from somebody who's a little bit older than you. The Bible says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. What my wife and I have done is we've said, we're going to ask people who are in the stage of life that we want to be at soon. We're not going to ask people who are in the same stage of life. We're going to ask those who have gone a little bit further down the road than us, and we're going to get advice from them because they've been where we want to be. Hey, always remember, church, you matter, Jesus matters, grace matters, and details matter. I love you. look forward to seeing you this Sunday.